Hello, I'm Chris Mallard, The Daily Atheist, and you are watching The Atheist Edge. Stick around. Hi, welcome to Atheist Edge. I'm Courtney here with James Randall. Nice, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I'm just meeting you today. I don't know too much about um, your background, uh, but I guess we'll start with um, why... Do you know why you were asked to come on the show? I have no idea. Yeah? <laughs> it's just I madness? I have no idea, but we're trying to promote our film stuff, so anytime anybody asks me to do a podcast or something, I'm generally going to jump on it. Mm -hmm. It's kind of free advertising. And I think probably the reason that Jim wanted me to do this interview was because I am such a movie fan. I'm such really? a movie-like obsessed person. I I worked at Blockbuster for three years, and so I have a lot of... A huge You're movie old enough collection. To remember Blockbuster? Yeah, well, I worked <laughs> I worked there for three years, and uh, it was back in like 2008 uh, to 2011, and it was just really fun because I got to my whole job was just like talking to people about movies, and it was really fun because I, I love I love them so much. What's your favorite? Um, favorite movie? Yeah. Uh, probably Call Me by Your Name, which is it's like an Italian like gay love story <laughs> which is the best uh so i really love drama specifically i really love things that have uh quality storytelling um and quality acting and more recently i'm kind of learning what a difference quality production value and cinematography <laughs> makes um can, because certainly. i i'm kind of new to you know following certain directors or following certain cinematography quality because i i come from more of an acting and like writing background, and so that's much more important to me than um, than some of the other like cinematography stuff. Well, and it should be. I mean, it, the story is everything, and if you can, you can. It's been proven you can make a, a movie on your iPhone. Like if you have a good story, people will watch it. They don't really right. care about all the rest of that stuff. Yeah, and I think that there is a big push lately to um, to want that content, and and I think. A lot of actors are noticing that that the the level of honesty and, and um, genuineness coming from the screen is uh, from from the story and from the acting is uh, is kind of winning the day. Right. In fact, um, Daniel Radcliffe, uh, Harry Potter, mm -hmm. um, Robert Pattinson, the guy that's going to be the new Batman. They they both were in big franchises, and then the last couple of years you haven't really heard a lot from them. Mm. It's because they went and did these like film noirs. They did more. I guess you call it like a localized story mm -hmm. or a story where it's just more about the actual story than, you know, waving a wand and, yeah. you know, lightning bolts and stuff. <laughs> right. And and those, I think the popularity of stories like Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings and things are, are well, they were both in Harry Potter. Uh, but the, <laughs> the the popularity of those kind of stories are, they, they play along very human um kind of epic storytelling. Right. It's the hero story. Yeah. Right? They, they actually teach you this when you're a... I was I was studying to be an English major and do okay. journalism. So when I was in college, they went over the whole hero's journey, and mm -hmm. most stories somehow fall along the basic plot points of the hero's journey. Mm -hmm. There's always the conflict, and then the hero has to solve this, but they may not be able to do it this way. And then, it, but essentially, every movie is kind of the same. Now, I'll have to admit, I've never seen Harry Potter. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. People always look at me like, "What? Like, it's I've it's never not seen just it. it's not just one movie. It's a lot." But yeah. Yeah. Well. <laughs> Any it's, of them. A, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot to watch if you're just gonna <laughs> make that commitment. And I think that's what's put me off of it. Is this, there's like it's all done now, but there's so many films that I just haven't really sat down and you know had the time, I guess, to to dig through it all. Yeah, it's funny. It's it's a a full blown hobby of mine to watch movies. I really I love relate. them so much. <laughs> so um, and there is a big. Uh, so many directions we can come from this conversation, mm -hmm. but there is also a big. Uh, kind of market now for uh, TV quality content being made. Uh, there's just a market for content in general. Right. Um, and in fact, that's why I started down this path, because mm -hmm. I realized um, doing music wasn't paying anymore. Mm. Um, there's just 10 million rock bands. Yeah. You know? And you can, you'll occasionally get the, the rock band that comes out like Korn or something that's just completely different and will get all that attention. But mm -hmm. um, I did realize though that everybody walks around there staring at their phone every day, all day. And half the time they're not on social media. They're actually just watching stuff. Yeah. They might be watching podcasts like this or they're mm -hmm. watching Netflix or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But while the access has increased for people, mm -hmm. the content hasn't because you still only have Hollywood making stuff mm -hmm. until the last five, 10 years where cameras have been 
you know, people don't realize like you can't just throw something on Netflix. Mm. They have strict standards about what cameras you can use to, to film what you're throwing out there. Mm. So if you're not using one of these half a million dollar cameras, then they're not going to look at your stuff. That's interesting. Well, and, and it's, it is funny if you kind of look at what is on Netflix, the incredible amount of stuff on Netflix, a lot of it is really awful stuff. <laughs> and so you get this like, you have this threshold that they have of quality, right. but I'm not sure that, yeah, quality can be seen in different lights, I guess. Well, I mean, it, it's like comedy. Mm. So, so the show we're doing now is comedy and we were slightly nervous to do a comedy because not everybody gets everybody's sense of humor. Mm. I might say something I think is absolutely hysterical and somebody look at me like I'm the worst person on the planet, yeah. you know? So it, it, when it comes to quality, I guess everybody likes different stuff. I mean, I can't, I can't watch half the movies that Sylvester Stallone's in, but mm. that dude is rich and people love it, so. Yeah, yeah, it is funny that there's the different audiences will latch onto different things and, and mm -hmm. you get that from like different cult followings. Um, but I think some people kind of go after the critically acclaimed stuff and I, I typically do because it usually, again, has this threshold of quality. Um, in, do you mean go after like attack it or go after like go after go like watch it? like yeah be interested in it because okay. it, and it depends on the on the genre like for example horror films are something that I really avoid. I am also not a horror film fan. Yeah, I I I don't have the uh, the bravery I guess to sit through like the the jump scares and I I do think that a lot of the horror genre is just focused on the scare tactic versus quality of acting, quality right. of cinematography, um, also quality of story. Like sometimes the, the decisions that are made in the film or just, you know, the way that the storyline is, is so ridiculous. And for me, I really love psychological thrillers. I really love, you know, Hitchcock and things that are uh, story first and character driven versus mm -hmm. like uh, something that's just that aim to scare people. Right. I, it it's that's why I have a problem with horror too because I do mm. feel like they rely too heavily on that mm. and I, I it doesn't scare me I mean because I'm sitting there in the theater the as opposite. somebody who's done this <laughs> yeah like I know what's coming mm -hmm. and really if you turn your ears off you will not enjoy a horror film because it's yeah. all just bang sound effects that's still yeah. trying to get you I can't but it gets me every time because I don't like it it's and... very rare that it gets me to jump I gotta oh. be in like a Dolby theater or something. Mm -mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no matter what it is, even if it's supposed to be like a scary comedy, like if it's supposed to be kind of tongue in cheek and like stupid, uh, like there was a um, Pride and Prejudice and Zombies oh God. or something. And and I, I watched it because it it looked like a, you know, a badass chick kind of film because it was like, you know, the characters of Pride and Prejudice as these girls who were like really good fighters mm. and they battle zombies and it's just really cool, the concept. Um, so I wanted to watch it, but I went and saw it in theaters and of course, like, it's it's a comedy and it's kind of ridiculous, but it was scary enough for me to, like, spill my martini <laughs> over everything. Like, I was holding my apple martini at, at Movie Tavern and, like, something just happened, like, ah. duh, you know? And, I'm, and it, I, like, moved and it just, like, half my martini, like, got everywhere. So it's amusing you bring up the, the world-famous apple teeny because mm. when I was in my... Uh, the last band I played in, we our whole shtick was that we were these really douchey guys <laughs> who were completely over the top. Like, oh, so no. we would go play shows. I remember one time I went to the limo, and we had a girl come out, like a flower girl, and she comes out and she's putting roses down for us to walk on. Yeah, and like so, we told her only set them up so far. And she didn't know what we we're gonna do, right? So we mm. get out. I've got photographer friends. They're taking pictures. Flash, 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 flash. Everybody's yep. looking up. Like, what the hell's going on? And we get out and we walk only as far as the rose petals. And then we fold our arms and we're like, what do you expect us? Like, we were those guys. I mean, we That's would, so funny. We'd walk up to the door and we'd stare at each other like, I'm not opening my own door, you know? <laughs> so one of our things That's was we, we played pretty hard metal, mm. right? Um, it was surprising considering we were guy liner and, you know, just oh. 80s dressed flashy, right? Oh. But our thing was we would always drink apple teenies. So <laughs> we'd be playing these hardcore bars like Reno's and we're just sitting there with our apple teeny and a pinky up. That is awesome. I will never forget. We, we had a giant crowd at Reno's one day and these biker guys are just staring at me. And I walked over and I was like, if I bought you an apple teeny right now, you'd drink it, wouldn't you? <laughs> oh, no. And he was like, no, bro, I would drink that. And then I was like, okay, bet. These are, these are Bud so, Light people. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> so one of them finally is like, dude, I'll do it. Bring it. It's alcohol, right? Bring it on. And the next thing you know, these five bikers are drinking apple teas oh with God. me. And they're like, this is actually really tasty. That's and I was hilarious. Like, I was like, guys, have you never dated someone and sampled their drink? Aww. They drink tasty stuff. Like, I drink whiskey cute. straight, but you know. So do I. Um, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> but, apple teenies, go. <laughs> that's so funny. Well, and I've I've gone away from apple teenies now because I like martinis that are much less sweet. And I can't I can't do the. I feel like as we sweet. get older, we our sweet senses don't kind of. I don't even eat dessert. I guess so. so. Yeah, no, I'm still a dessert whore, but like, <laughs> but, I, <laughs> but I will do. I do a lot of like old fashions that are less sweet. And, oh yeah. Um, and I'll do. Have you ever had a chocolate old fashioned? Straight whiskey? No. Pretty good. Interesting. There's chocolate bitters. Maybe just oh, chocolate bitters. <gasps> oh, you just rocked my world. All right. Opening minds um, over here. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, here on Atheist instead. Uh, yeah. So I I do I tend to with with alcohol I tend to go with the richer darker versions of things. So like with wine I'll drink Merlot. With beer I drink stouts. Um, and I, it's just my my preference. I really like. It's it's what I tend to go for, but it's I find it really funny that I just happen to have, with every version of like drinks, I tend to go with like the most hardcore version of it. Of course. What's really funny is I was just the other day, uh, like a w couple weeks ago, I was over um, at this awesome, uh, I guess craft beer. It's not a brewery, but it was a it was a bar. It's called uh, Cool Keg in Arlington, right by UTA. Mm. Um, cool Keg. Cool Keg. Yeah, it's with K. It cool keg um but they uh they have a, a huge variety of of different um local craft beers and um and i ordered this uh cayenne pepper stout it was like mm. spicy really dark rich stout which is like right up my alley it's amazing and what was funny is these two like you know macho guys i ordered like between them and they both looked at me. They were like, like "Oh, what? that's a badass order for a chick." Like, what? And then they <laughs> and they were like, "Oh, let's give her a seat. She's gonna sit with us." And it was so funny because the they got so excited. That's the mild sexism there. That's the it, mild sexism. I know. It was just really. <laughs> oh, it was girl, so. Girl, you're drinking the chocolate stout. Right, yeah. right. It was so funny though. I was like, oh, "I'll take that, whatever." But it was, just, it was really funny. You because, should definitely try yeah. a uh, jalapeno martini one day. Oh yes, actually, I might have. Well, I've had like a jalapeno, strawberry margarita which again is more sweet now than i would probably mm. go after but just recently i had sound good. <laughs> <laughs> just recently i had a jalapeno margarita um <clears throat> from like a steakhouse and it was just like a straight original margarita but it had a bunch of jalapenos in it mm. very good um it wasn't as spicy as i wanted it to be but steakhouse so i take it you're not vegan no not you guys vegan. were talking about the chicken thing you're vegan really vegetarian yeah they all if, if we film at jim's house we used to do that uh they'll make these like meatless uh, meatball things that are really good, but I I will I enjoy that. That's where me and you will have the fireworks, my friend. All right. I accidentally dated three vegans in a row, and I never will again. Accidentally? It's, yes. They don't tell you. <laughs> well, why not? I don't know. Is that like a they secret? didn't tell me? Like I had no idea, and then it's like after we went out for a while, the first one, I thought she was just doing the like some girls will didn't want to eat in front of you for some reason. Oh. Yeah. So like I thought, okay, she'd order a salad, big deal. Like yeah. That's no. Oh no. I really love salads anyway. It was anyway. because she was hardcore vegan. Okay. And it's an issue with me. Yeah. Like, I enjoy I, steak. I can't have you staring at yeah. me like I'm killing I people. I love <laughs> steak. How do you do your steak though? Uh, I prefer medium rare, mm -hmm. but I don't mind if it's medium. I'm a rare person. Yeah. I'll, I'll take medium rare, but if I'm ordering myself, rare. As rare as you can do. It's the best. You should try the, uh, you should try the, uh, the one at Gordon Ramsay's in Vegas. Ooh. He Actually, does the, the, what do they call it? Wellington? Amazing. Oh yeah, Wellington. Yeah, I it's got like the the pastry on right. On the it's, outside. it's like puff pastry, and then mm -hmm. they have the it's like a mushroom. Kind I'm also of, a food nerd. <laughs> yeah. Oh yes, I love cooking. It's like I love cooking so this much. This is another thing no one knows about me, but when I get home from like doing an eight hour shift DJing or or, or playing music or doing film, mm -hmm. like that's how I relax. Mm. I will go on YouTube and I'll find a new recipe and I'll yes. figure it out. Yes. Highly recommend it. In fact. Yes little date idea for some of you people out there because uh, some of the girls I've dated really enjoyed this. Mm. Take 20 bucks, run to the store, come up with a dish that neither one of you's ever eaten and mm. learn to cook it together. Mm. You'll have a blast. Oh, so bonding. It's all my favorite yeah. things, so I'm not minding it. Yeah, we talk about alcohol <laughs> and now we're talking about food. Well, and, and I, I nerd out on all three of those things on movies mm -hmm. and alcohol and food because, yeah, but I think my, my interest in alcohol has never been like the drunk factor of it. It's always been like the 
the artistry of, of how it's put together and, and the thought behind it and food as well. Have you ever made your own alcohol? No. Mm. But meaning like the mixture of different flavors for cocktails and stuff, I really like, uh, you know, signature cocktails usually um, if, they're, if they're done well. Um, one of my favorite cocktails was this, uh, it was a gin cocktail down in Austin. I was there years ago and there was this little hole in the wall place that had it was just like straight gin with ice and then on top of that was a spoon and in the spoon was raspberry jam and chili pepper jam hmm. and you would just like mix the spoon in and it was like this oh it was so ridiculously good now that's something um, i've not heard of that <laughs> yeah and that was the very first time that i had like a spicy cocktail and it was the best and then um also martin house is a local brewery in fort worth and they uh they used to make a um, like salsa, Wait a spicy Martin salsa House beer. Do the uh, pretzel stout, or, or probably the wrong one. I don't know. They do like salty lady. Okay. And, I uh, bet they are. And they yeah, do they do a lot of stuff, too. prickly pear and stuff like that. But they uh, a lot of their a lot of their beers are more like IPA bitter, and I I can't do that that many hops. Yeah, but I I do guy. love uh, I really loved this beer. It was one of my favorites, and my first spicy beer was uh, it's called Salsa Verde, and it it had like. Green, green tomatillos in it and it was like a in the beer spicy flavor oh. yeah spicy flavor um salsa kind of flavor beer and they had this food truck in the back uh, at their brewery that had like barbacoa tacos and it was just the best <laughs> like thing together i was like oh my god i'm like dying going to heaven it's so good um jim did you have some oh that one recording session where we made sidecars it's i don't know how to pronounce it cointro cointro Oh yeah, Cointreau. Cointreau. Yeah, it's Cointreau, um, Cavassier, and Brandy. Any one of those will knock you on your ass. And the, the last half of that recording session, none of us even remember. It, <laughs> it, it was fucking insane. Oh, Food, I guess. I really, I really love cooking at home, and it is therapeutic. Baking and cooking both, I love. I'm not as big a fan of the baking as I am of everything else because to me, baking is kind of boring. You know, once you combine your ingredients, throw it in the oven. There's not much more to it. I mean, That's true. I, I know mean, some bakers that would probably punch me for saying that. But well, it depends on what you're making. Like you know, if you're doing something that has to be like kneaded and rolled out and everything, then that's right. more of a process. Um, but yeah, I like to do you know scones from scratch and and pasta. Oh man, I've never made pasta. You've never made pasta? No. Oh my god, it's just flour and eggs. That sounds so good. And the the beauty of it is if you make it yourself. So the pasta they sell you at the store is. Mm -hmm obviously full of chemicals and mm. I'm not going to get off on all that nonsense because I don't particularly care about that stuff. But and you're not you can taste the, <laughs> you can taste the difference when you make your own pasta at home. Oh yeah, I bet you can. Because it's fresh and yeah. on top of that you can infuse it with stuff. So like when I make pasta I'll put basil in it or I'll put, <gasps> yes. I'll put you know, oh rosemary gosh. in it or something, you know. Oh my gosh, it's <laughs> so good. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Anyway, we can talk about that forever. <laughs> oh, I let's, could. <laughs> let's, let's go back to uh, to films. You you did say that okay. you um you are involved in filmmaking, and I'm I am curious how you made that transition from music to film. I quit my band. Uh huh. And I said I'm going to do film. But what made what got you interested in film? Uh, literally, it's the content thing. Mm -hmm. Like I wasn't. It's funny enough when I went to 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 start with the film stuff. I'd been doing music videos and stuff for my band, mm. which was the Goofy Band. Yeah. And so we made fun videos for YouTube, basically. I want to see this. And, this is uh, fun. Oh, I had to take all that stuff down. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so we can't we can't link to it? You won't find anything. Not my oh. old podcasts, nothing. I've wiped my Facebook, wiped my oh. Twitter. Like, I had to. I had no choice. Like, mm. when I went to get on to actually put the film out professionally, they look at you really hard. And mm. they're like, you can't have anything come back on you because these people will come after you, blah, blah, blah. I don't personally give a damn, like, because I don't care what anybody thinks. But they're like, listen, we're not going to have this come back on us as a company. So like mm. these, these like you guys were talking about earlier, the woke people, mm. they will come and they will go after your advertisers. They will go do anything they can to deplatform you if they feel like you're yeah. a bad person mm -hmm. or if you say something they disagree with. Mm -hmm. So out of respect for my cast and crew, I just wiped all my stuff out because I've been a comedian for like 20 years. Really? Yeah. I, I mean, we, our show was a shock jock show. Mm -hmm. That's what we did. We made the worst jokes. You know, we weren't out there being like racist or something, but people would be like, oh my God, I can't believe you said that. And mm -hmm. Considering how much work goes into the films and how much money it costs me, like it's just a smart move not to yeah. have anything out there, I guess. Did you, do you know anything about Daniel Sloss? No. He, uh, he's a comedian uh, from uh, Ireland, 
Scotland? <laughs> Something. I think he's Scottish or Irish. I think he's Scottish. Um, yeah, but he he does a lot of material about the concept of like offensive comedy, and he also did a TED talk about it too. Um, that I'd like to see. Yeah, it's I'm a it's big cool. TED talk watcher. Yeah, so he, he did a really great TED talk. Unfortunately, it's a little awkward because he threw some like jokes in there, but the audience was like not knowing that it was supposed to be funny right. so they didn't laugh and that was <laughs> awkward because yeah like he told some he said some things that were very tongue-in-cheek and like obviously kind of kidding and uh and it was just like silent but he, he did right. okay he moved on but he's he is a very young comedian um and he uh he started pretty young but he has some really interesting stuff about the concept of offensive comedy and kind of the difference between um, something, a subject of a joke and the butt of a joke, and then right, uh, and the importance of like molding it correctly to where it comes out as not being. See, uh, so I, I've kind of waffled on this over the years, mm -hmm. and I don't feel like I've made my decision. But generally speaking, I've been kind of the guy that's like, you can either laugh at everything or laugh at nothing, mm -hmm. because I don't want somebody telling me I can't find something funny, mm -hmm. you know, or or how to think, or that's why I'm atheist, you know, right. And it was kind of funny to hear you guys talk about um, how, I think it was your previous guest, the rapper, he was saying that, you know, 50 years ago, he wouldn't be able to stand outside of church and protest and stuff yeah. because that's that policing your mindset stuff, yeah. which I'm wholly against. Mm. You know, huge First Amendment person. Mm. You should be able to say anything, even if it's stupid, mm -hmm. and then people can decide how they want to react to that and whether they want to engage with you or not. Yes, 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 yes. And I and we've we've talked about this on the show, the, the concept of like deplatforming and um, and taking away someone's voice. And I think that, cancel you know, I, yeah, cancel culture. I think we can all agree on our channel, at least, that um, it's better to allow people to speak and then say something better in response and, and have the, the best yes. ideas win the day. I wholly agree. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's really unfortunate, this kind of movement of, of like, don't you know? Don't let them speak. You make martyrs out of these people, and sometimes their their messages right. are not well, worthy of that. And on top of that, I mean, just to throw aside the the First Amendment part of it, in some cases, you really are preventing somebody from making a living. And mm. for me, I think that's an awful, awful thing. Yeah, you should never ever mess with somebody's ability to make a living or to yeah. support their family. Well, and and even further than that, you do have other groups that will actually come after you and like threaten you and threaten your family. And how ridiculous is it to want to? to be violent against somebody because they just don't agree with you. I mean, that's yeah. the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard, but it's that's awful. kind of the climate right now. Yeah, and I, there's a term, I think, for like giving out someone's address and giving them the real name. Doxing, yeah. So like, the, it's so insane, the level of... It's happened to me before, just, actually. <laughs> yeah, oh no. I had, I had these guys like, oh, we'll come to your house. I'm like, no, you won't, because I'm a heavy Second Amendment guy. Believe me, you're not gonna come to my house. Oh, it's so insane. Well, and you shouldn't have to make that kind of response. Like that's ridiculous that it's happening in the first place. Um, it's it's horrible. Um, but yeah. So moving into film, yes, <laughs> we're going all the way back from the beginning of the conversation <laughs> back to uh, what are do you you're dabbling in different uh, genres of film, which I find right. interesting. So I don't know if there's a reason that people tend to stay within a certain genre if they like it the most or if they have the most experience. Uh, I think part of it is, have you ever heard stick to what you're good at, yeah. for example? Mm -hmm. Well, if you're a successful filmmaker and you've done nothing but horrors, but mm. you know you're gonna make another successful film mm. if you do horror, mm -hmm. some guys are, are that way. I don't like doing that. Mm. I don't think it's challenging and I'm, I get bored easy, so. Yeah. What, what is interesting is uh, someone like John Krasinski uh, comes from the background of comedy. He's an actor, right. and his debut uh, writing, directing film uh, was something within the horror genre. But he, I think, he made the genre better because he made it more of a suspense film. He made it a. It was a different approach for sure. Yeah, yeah. he made it a character-driven. Uh, I really like him, by the way. I, oh yeah, I, I love enjoyed it. The Office. I don't know why people yeah. don't think it's funny. I guess they've never worked in an office or something. Do people not think it's funny? I've met a lot of people. <laughs> There's such a cult following. They cannot it. believe I like that show. And I'm just like... Well, and some people are purists of like, you know, the British show is better and I haven't whatever. seen that one. Uh, that's the one with Gervais, right? Mm -hmm, I believe. Ricky Gervais. Uh, I, yeah, I love him anyway. But, I think um, he's pretty funny. And he will be at Faithless Form, I think. Uh -huh. I this think. is the first of her. I don't know what Faithless Form is. Will he is. be? Maybe. Maybe I'm wrong on that. <laughs> is it like um, a convention or...? It, okay, so Faithless Form is a, a content creator's convention. Oh. Or it's a content creators conference, atheist conference. So it's it's made and built around and for uh, basically YouTubers 
okay. atheist YouTubers. And so it has a lot to do with kind of sharing process, sharing education on how to, how to do this yourself. Um, and it kind of just brings together um, content creators around uh, the atheist topic. Mm. Um, and so they've had... So this is all fascinating to me because growing yeah. up, this was not a thing. Oh, well, and you couldn't. it wouldn't be. You can, my, my parents literally disowned me when I told them I was atheist. Mm. I haven't seen them since. It's oh, been man. like 22 years or something like that. Yeah. Uh, they were heavily, heavily Catholic. And then it, my mother decided one day she was now Jewish. And then one day mm. she was this weird type of Christian. And then this type <laughs> of Christian. It was all exhausting for me. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, yeah, so Faithless Forum is is really fun, and it's a lot of it started in in DFW, and it's kind of a um, it's built around some local atheist YouTubers, and then it's going to be in Austin this year, so it's still pretty local. But um, but I'm I'm going to be there, and it's going to be fun. Awesome. Um, it's fun, but we we did it. The first one was like two years ago, so it's an annual thing now. Mm. Um, and we were there at the first one. So this and, is new, new, huh? Yeah. It's, this is only the third third year that they're doing it, but it's it's becoming a bigger conference every year, and hmm. um, and it's really awesome. I love it. Uh, but they do a lot of you know talks by different um, YouTubers, and it's a lot of what they're talking about is the choices they make about their channel and how they navigate certain you know hate comments and um, I I completely like that. ditched YouTube when hmm. they started demonetizing everybody. I just didn't care anymore. Yeah, I mean I just don't care. <laughs> Not good. Well, and everybody everybody makes their money off of Patreon anyway now. Yeah, I, I do hear a lot of that at the end of videos. You know, yeah. Support me on Patreon. People or always like Patreon, Patreon, Patreon because that you have a lot more control over. Um, you know, you're not going to get demonetized for a video on Patreon. Right. Uh, Patreon is very separate from the content you create. It's mostly just like setting up an account and people donating to that account, almost like it's PayPal. But um, but it's kind of it's built around. Uh, actually a, a band my one of my absolute favorite bands is this band uh, called Pomplamoose they're based out of LA um, and they one of the guys on Pomplamoose it's a married couple now that when they started they were like dating but they um, he started Patreon um, years ago and they did a TED talk about that as well um, about starting Patreon and, and it was built around music artists and kind of having an alternative right for people uh, See, that are and, smaller to get like get, when like I was uh, when I was saying earlier about going into film and getting out of music, mm. I used to make a living doing music. Mm -hmm. Like that's all I did was play. And yeah. after a while, you get these programs like Spotify that come in, and people don't even realize that you can get like ten million plays on Spotify, and mm. your check is like two fifty, like two dollars mm. and fifty cents. Not even oh two hundred and fifty, two dollars and fifty cents. Oh my gosh! And the way they squeeze you is the the known artists get a better deal. And yeah. it's the same way on uh, films as well. Mm. If you're a known director, you get a better deal. Right. If people watch your stuff more, you get a better deal. Like the price changes per view, per minute, per whatever. I see. Yeah. Well, and, and what was interesting is so Patreon was built around the concept that these big labels will view um, an artist that makes millions of dollars as a failure and right. um, will kind of you know move on in the label. And the people that for these labels, the people that make, you know, the insane money make enough for the company to cover the rest of the artists that aren't as successful. Right. But now you have these companies are not, they're just not supporting artists anymore. Mm. They're, they're only doing the big name ones. That's why if you'll notice, I don't know how deeply into rock or metal you get. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm an acoustic, like ukulele girl yeah. <laughs> that's, <Okay. laughs> that's my, well, my genre. actress plays ukulele actually yeah. that's a fun story i'll have to tell you that's my genre. but um what they did now is if you notice most of the major rock bands are not on a label they're all mm. on their own label because mm. no one will will no one will will take them and give them the support somebody like taylor swift is going to get right. and at the same time now yeah. where it used to be the they were making monies off cds and downloads etc cetera, etc cetera, now they want your tour money so these mm. labels are trying to sign bands and give them to give up their tour money. And the tour money was mm. always just the band's money. Mm. Oh. Most of the time, like Metallica, for example, uh, when they did the Black Album, they made a fortune off the tour and they sold a hell of a lot of albums, but they yeah. got a tiny, tiny fraction off those album sales. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really complicated. Jim, what's up? I've been noticing the trend too. Uh, musicians, bands, comedians, uh, they, they cut out Ticketmaster right out of the equation. They start selling their own tickets yep. because that's price gouging. And they, 
-hmm. and it's actually a win-win situation for the fans and the music and yeah. the artists. Yeah, yeah man. because it's really just a middleman service that you just don't need. Yeah. I mean. Yeah, and uh, someone like Amanda Palmer, she all again TED talks. She does a really good TED talk about uh, moving away from her label that that she was signed to and not even creating a label of her own, but just going as an independent artist that would uh, kind of crowdfund before that was a thing her right. tours so she would make money she would i think she gave her music away for free and she would uh only make her money just enough basically to be on tour and she would have people like uh through some online forum she would bring out like hey i'm going to this town is there some fan that i can stay with and she just stays in people's houses and people just contribute wow. what they want to to the music and to the performances. Um, and she actually comes from being a performing artist uh, on like the streets. I, I don't remember which city she was in, but she had this thing where she was the, the 10 foot bride and she would dress in like this, uh, she would put white makeup all over her face and like dress in this long uh, uh, wedding gown and stand on this big platform to where she was like 10 feet tall and her whole job was to collect tips for giving out flowers and she wouldn't speak a word and so it was just really interesting she would like give this gratitude and that's like her background as a performing artist um moving into the music industry which because that's how she started um where she talks about kind of that experience helping her become the artist that she wanted to be musically and like and yeah, well, there's a direct correlation between the artist and the person that's consuming the art. I mean, that's mm -hmm. that's all across the board, whether you're doing uh, books or, which I'm going to be a published author later this year, too. So I mm. uh, forgot about that. I should have wrote that down. <laughs> um, it, it's it's the same. You, you can be the kind of artist. There's two kinds of artists, in my view. There's the mm -hmm. kind that make art for themselves and hope people like it. Mm -hmm. And there's the kind that make art for people. Mm -hmm. And I don't think mm -hmm. the kind that make art for people are true artists. Mm. And I think it, it affects what you're creating if you're too worried about how people are going to perceive your art. Interesting. Yeah, and that, and sometimes that's you find that in the YouTube community as well of, of only making things for how it's going to be perceived by other people. Um, very, very limiting. Yeah, and unfortunately, it I think YouTube favors the the latter. Like YouTube kind of favors. They're about their money. Playing, playing to their algorithm <laughs> and, and playing to, you know, clickbait and all that. Oh yeah. Um, but what's interesting is I think the people who transcend all of that kind of noise of YouTube and get to very successful shows where they can be independent YouTubers and um, like Joe Rogan. Yeah. Pe people that, people that can like make a living off of just that uh, are people who kind of are aware and play the game, but they also kind of keep their integrity and their individuality. They can afford to. Right, and yeah, and so it's, I think it has a lot to do with luck, and I think most people that, that are successful in this industry, just like a lot of other industries in the entertainment business, um, it's it, it's a, a little bit talent, but it's mostly like who you know and circumstances and timing and... I think that's true. Mm -hmm. But I also think that's changing, mm. and I think you're going to see a giant change over the next 20 years in that because we don't have to get lucky anymore right. because your content's going to be there. So somebody's going to be able to see it at, at one point, one day, whereas before you couldn't do that, and you had to be lucky in that somebody like a talent scout or something shows mm -hmm. up at your show or whatever. Yeah. You don't need them now. Well, but it's it's also true, you know, especially with YouTube, of whether you're just in the giant ocean of, of unviewed content versus like algorithms kind of you know, giving you uh, priority and right, and so it's it is kind of sometimes you don't know what uh, what video is going to be you know hit the right sweet spot of that and um, anyway, but we're we're sort of I think our channel is kind of in the ocean. I think we're not we're not like as uh, as like big as a lot of other channels are. But we, what's interesting we've is stopped growing after eight thousand subscribers mm. we've been stagnant for four months oh. so now we need to find a way to kickstart it yeah. well i imagine that it's not a quite a popular topic to talk about atheism so there's, you're there's, gonna immediately lose be. some of the audience that's oh, available that's yeah we're usually only viewed by like 
other atheists and the atheist community is only going to be so big. And I find that so unfortunate. I think everybody should watch and view things that they don't agree with. But and they should stop, a you know. Subscribers. Mm. There's some atheist YouTubers out there with a quarter of a million, half a million subscribers. Mm -hmm. Really? So it's possible. Yeah. Oh, it's and, definitely possible. And more. Yeah. But well, and and also, you know, we talk about echo chambers and things there with with algorithms and with um, the way that the internet uh, gives you things that it thinks you will like. We, yeah, we all kind you, of are. Once you start watching in this echo chamber of one online. of those little groups of people or whatever, then they all pop up. You know, right? Yeah. If you, yeah, it's really interesting. You can get, you can kind of mess with your algorithm by looking up things that are very wildly different from what the algorithm thinks you will like. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting. Like, I'm sure they're going to have some kind of uh, seminar on some platform about how to make your algorithm less tailored to you uh, i would hope that they would because it's it is unfortunate that like the people that don't want to live in an echo chamber and are aware of it it's it's difficult to get out of it yeah and it's unfortunate that people are so they're they're so they, they feel good when they're in their echo chamber yeah. so they'd rather listen to an hour podcast with somebody they completely agree with mm -hmm. because then they're almost turning their brain off yeah. It's like, yeah, I, I'm completely with this guy. He knows what he's talking about. Oh, yeah, rah, 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 rah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas opposed to, I mean, how not to talk too badly about people in general sense, they don't like to challenge themselves. Yeah. Most people just don't. They don't want any kind of challenge outside of going to their job and going home. So yeah. when they go to look at content to be entertained, they're certainly not going to look up something that they would disagree with hmm. because they're not interested in learning. So with your... Um, I never thought of that. With your... What? I never... Sorry. <laughs> with your with your movies, um, so I guess maybe tell us about the the sci-fi one. Yeah. Okay. So I can't believe that thing's on TV. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm very honest about my work. Mm -hmm. So uh, basically, me and my guys and gals had I call everybody guys and dudes and bros. You know. <laughs> um, with your martini. That's regardless of <laughs> oh yeah with my apple teeny pinky up. Do you still drink things? Uh, no. Do you still like no? No. It's just like I, I would, but mm -hmm. I'm just a straight whiskey guy now, so mm -hmm. Jameson's my go-to. Jameson, um, okay. Sip a Jameson and drink a Guinness, and I'm good I to go. Oh, yeah. But what? you gotta drink it cold. <laughs> That's the problem. Cold whiskey is the way to go. Oh, it has to I be like, super cold. I like room temperature, but I also I don't I don't put ice in it either. But um, but room I do like makers. The vapors will get in your nose, and then that's true. It's, you know, I like the strength. Like makers, it's, it's not bad. I like the burn. It's a little sweet for me. It is um, kind of sweet. But yeah, so I, I, my guys and gals came to me and they're like, We're, we want to do a movie. Mm. And I said, well, we can't do a movie. It's not possible. And they were basically, rah, rah, we believe it. Let's do it. Mm. We're down. And so I was like, okay, I guess I have, I've got to write a movie now. So um, I wrote a script and we shot half of it and then the actor quit on us. Mm. Now, this wasn't for the sci-fi. This was our first attempt at a film. And um, after going through that process, I learned a lot. And so I wrote a second script. So I actually wrote Project Galaxy while we were filming because I was getting the sense this dude was going to bail on us. Mm. And um, cast people, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and we basically worked 12 hour days. Like it was sun up to sundown some days. Um, mm. I don't think it's a very good film. And I didn't expect it to be because mm. it's the first time I'd ever done it. And I, I learned by doing. So the more I do, the better I get at things. Mm -hmm. Like that's just always been my life. So I knew it was gonna suck, I didn't care. <laughs> we made it anyways. Somehow it got on Amazon, it blew my mind. I didn't even know, they didn't tell me. Mm -hmm. I, like, I found out my movie dropped on Amazon Prime because oh. the guy that's acting in my second film called me to congratulate me. I'm Aww. driving to work. And I was like, what are you talking about? This isn't funny. Aww. You joke about stuff like that, dude. What the fuck is wrong with you, Aww. you know? And basically um, I get to work and people at work are like, oh my God, dude look look on their oh, cell phones and cute. i'm just like what the hell is going on Aww. that film are you kidding me mm. so well how does that happen by accident like what well you submit it but they didn't tell me oh i see so that's it was weird i didn't get an email or anything at all it just popped on one day and oh my friends were looking for that it is weird i thought it was a little weird maybe there was a typo in your in your email you sent or something <sighs> because it's they might have possible i would assume that they would say something if they're going to put it on their right thing so, so uh this this particular film that one, I, I had to cut some of the scenes. We couldn't afford to film them. Mm. So it lost some of its luster, I guess you'd say. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was 
it's a sci-fi, but it's really about the people. It's more story based. Mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately, some of the action scenes I just had to slash because we couldn't afford it. Mm -hmm. Cost way too much. Mm -hmm. And we shot this thing in Colorado, um, parts of Oklahoma, and here in Texas. So mm -hmm. it was already pretty expensive to do all the traveling and mm -hmm. all that good stuff. So then you went right into uh, television, I guess, and then back to film. But No, actually, we shot our second film next. Oh, I see. Okay. So the, it's been uh, done for about six months to a year or something like that. And, oh, I um, see. We just, we bought, I bought a decent camera finally, um, mm. and we went to do the TV show as a, another test, and mm. they took the pilot, and then they wanted three episodes, and then it was six episodes, and so mm. we kind of, we've kind of been bouncing around, and uh, we're right now shooting, we just finished the back half of the season, so season one's next three episodes drop on April 1st, and it's not mm -hmm. a fool's joke. <laughs> nice. <clears throat> Meantime, we're shooting the... Uh, we're halfway through shooting the third film, mm -hmm. and I'm in the script stage for four and five. And I guess your second film is is more my my favorite genre. It's a drama. Yeah, yeah. I like I like dramas. Which I thought was interesting to do and a challenge for me because I'm not a drama guy. Yeah. So it was, it was a challenging thing to write from that kind of viewpoint. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think dr dramas for me tend to be their focus tends to be more on what I love movies for, which is the acting quality. Right. Um, right. And, you know, I think one of my favorite films recently is, um, what is it, 1917? Yes. Oh, it's so good. Very well done. It's ridiculous. Um, and I watched it twice in theaters. I probably would love to see it again in theaters. Uh, but I, I brought my dad to it because... I, I watched it on my own, and then I was like, no, my dad has to see this in theaters. So I was like, hey, dad, we're going to go or like this week. Yeah, um, and that's a pretty good example of like a drama-type story, mm -hmm. but it's just in that setting of, yeah. of war and action. and Right, yeah, and it was very, very character-driven. Yes. Um, and so that was really interesting. And it is, you know, it's, it's plot as well. Like, everything happens <laughs> as you move along. So I don't know how you distinguish that. Um, but yeah, so do... So in terms of like making films though, did you have a background of education in that? No. Okay, so how did you navigate like cinematography strategy and all of those things? Well, I watched a lot of movies. Yeah. Um, and I started watching things all the time. Like I would, mm. I even, I don't know if I can legally say this, but I used to have a mount on my truck dash. Mm. And so when I would drive some places, I'd have my phone going with, you know, stuff to watch. And uh, I've, I've, I've not... I'm yeah. That too. <laughs> <laughs> to me, to me, I always justified it to myself because I'm like, well, my eyes are on the road because it's yeah, right there true. in my windshield. That's like, true. You know? Oh, I really shouldn't do that, but yeah. <laughs> right. I've since long since stopped doing that. I don't I've, even look at my phone when I drive yeah, now. I'll do like YouTube videos and mostly listen, but just kind of glance over them once in a while. Right. But if there's something I have to read or something, then I'll just pause it and I'm like, no, I'm not tempting myself with right. that. I'm just gonna listen to music now. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I, I had zero percent background. I had no knowledge. I started watching videos of uh, other directors, mm -hmm. behind the scenes stuff, any little Blu-ray extras. You can mm -hmm. just get a look at the set and yeah. see what they're doing. Um, do you like commentaries, film commentaries? Uh, not particularly. Because they do get into sometimes. Sometimes, if you're if you're listening to like actors, and they'll talk about it's more playful. But yeah. if you're just like the the crew talking and yeah, like the director, they'll get really technical <clears throat> on like how they did certain shots and and what their concerns were and stuff. And that can be really interesting if you're into that. It can be. Thing. In fact, I had a friend texting me just now. Um, she was asking me if I've ever used a skateboard on, with a camera on it. Yeah. Which I get a lot of fun questions like that. Interesting. So. And uh, some people do. Yeah. You know, you got to do what you got to do to get your shot. Yeah. But at the same time, it's not as intensive now because you can do so much in post production. Yeah. So oh. I can go with a camera and do a shaky handheld shot mm. and completely smooth it just using my program. Wow. Whoa. That's crazy. It's helpful. Yeah. So I guess as you're making more films and you're getting more into this, you're learning as you go, obviously. And I know worlds more than I did. Yeah. Let's just say that. <laughs> yeah. And I think that you could say the same thing on a small, much smaller scale about like uh, creating content on YouTube and other things because right. a lot of people are like, you know, my first videos were the most horrifying thing that's the most embarrassing right. thing of my life. Um, and then you get, you know, as I know I've heard a lot of YouTubers say like every single video that they make, they want to have something that's a little bit better about it, and they kind of like right. seek out things. And that's exactly what we're going for. I'm, yeah. I'm hoping that with every project I do, 
they'll get better and one day I'll make a good film. Mm. So your um, atheism, is that uh, anything to do with what you do with film, like in terms of subject matter or uh, certain like moral messages? Mm. Actually, no. Yeah. Um, it depends. I mean, sometimes things are very separate and sometimes people will incorporate their ideas into those things. Right. Um, I, I, I don't like to... Uh, how do I put this? I like for my characters to be them. I don't mm. want them to be me. Yeah. And so I don't want to put point. my viewpoint into the character because mm -hmm. the character is not supposed to be me. It's supposed to be the character. Yeah. Well, and I, I do find it interesting sometimes when there are films that uh, seem to be about atheism or about what is important to most atheists. Things like uh, Sausage Party has a lot to do with like oh, yeah, yeah. dogma and giving the message in a way that's actually going to be received. Yeah, um, and you know, yeah. you have to decide as a filmmaker, are you making, it kind of goes back to my earlier argument about are you making art for yourself or for, pe for people to watch. Right. Uh, as a filmmaker, if you're gonna, you have to decide if you want to even have a message. I mean, yeah. some movies have no message whatsoever. Mm. Like Clerks has no message to it. Mm -hmm. It's just a, a goofy comedy of these two goofy dudes in a store. Yeah, and I think I really love messages or I really love things that that have something meaningful to say. Mm -hmm. um, they either like, most of the time, I really love things that just pose really interesting questions um, and don't really tell yes. you what to think. I and I think that. you would probably like that too. Absolutely. In yeah. fact, the, the sci-fi, it's about drug abuse. Mm. It's not even about aliens or any of that okay. kind of stuff. So, yeah. um, and that's the theme throughout it, but I don't come at it from obviously any religious viewpoint of you can't mm. do drugs is bad because God doesn't want you to or whatever. Mm. There's none of that in the film. Right. So it's more of a, I feel like more of an honest look at yeah. a situation or a problem without that whole worldview tinging it. Yeah. And I do remember, you know, the legitimacy of my Christian faith when I was religious, when I was a kid, uh, there being an issue to me with uh, every, all the media I was consuming around me, maybe it wasn't like Christian specifically, but it did play into a it narrative. It definitely had that theme. Yeah, yeah, a theme of like, you know, there being some kind of meaning behind things or there's a plan for everything or well, things America happen for is, a reason and America fate. is still a very deeply Christian country. I mean. Yeah, and I found that really interesting when I deconverted to look back and be like, oh, I, I remember looking at every my entire world and there wasn't anything contradicting that narrative um and again it wasn't specifically christian of media that i was only allowed to watch i wasn't one of, you know i wasn't one of those kids but like it was really interesting to me when i came out of that like oh wow i was really in a bubble of just general christian worldview or higher even, power even mr rogers neighborhood was kind of christiany yes you know what i mean like, well and he was a minister um and so his his way of of um, being a minister was trying to improve the lives of children and the perspective of children. And it wasn't for perpetuating his own narrative, I don't think, but I really loved him. <laughs> uh, I watched that documentary. He's certainly an incredible person. I haven't seen mm. the one with Tom Hanks yet. So, I haven't uh, seen the one with Tom Hanks either. Uh, you but you cry your eyes out. Yeah. Is it well, good? I, I've seen it three times already. Oh, uh -huh. well, I watched the documentary, uh, it's called Will You Be My Neighbor? And oh my gosh, I bawled the entire time because he reminded me so much of my dad uh, because my dad does children's magic <clears throat> and he has very positive messages and he was always very like encouraging and positive to me. And so he just, this man is so much the type of person that my father is. And it just like, my sister saw it. She lives in New York, so she saw it and I saw it. And we both just like bowl the whole time. Um, oh, New York is beautiful. It's so funny. Yeah, I, my sister's actually an actress. I, I've never, I'd never been before like two weeks ago. Oh, really? Yeah, it's what a beautiful city that is. Yeah, my sister has been an actress for. That's a good a place time. to do it. I mean, they say like New York and LA obviously are, are that's pretty much it. Everything yeah. else is supposed to be just country bumpkins, mm. I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm not sure I, I gave too much structure to this conversation, but, <laughs> but we could talk about this forever. Very <laughs> nice to meet you. It was nice to meet you. Yeah. You're a great conversationalist. Thank so you. I appreciate you guys having me on. Yeah. Well, we, we're always having fun here, but um, I'm always so excited to talk about food and uh, obviously atheism, but also films and, and alcohol and things that I really love to All talk about. All the things about. I enjoy. <laughs> yeah. Um, so thank you so much for, for being here. And um, We'll what? see you next time. Oh, where can we find you? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, well, we're if on anywhere. We're on. Uh, we're on Amazon Prime, obviously. Okay. Um, our stuff right now is free for Prime members. So if you have Prime membership, you don't have to pay. You can watch it. Um, and also, you can find us at realunicornproductions.com. 
and uh, we'll have a Roku channel soon, but mm -hmm. I haven't finished the coding for it, so. And your films are, uh, I guess, found in different places? Right now, we're just there. Uh -huh. Right now. We're, right where? We're just on Prime and Roku, okay. but And so I'm if they search on... your, your titles, what, give, yeah, give them actually, the titles. Yeah, actually, if you, if you search Project Galaxy, I think we're the first result that pops up. Mm -hmm. um, you have to you have to type in Funny Money Amazon Prime to get that one for some reason. Okay. Because apparently Chevy Chase made a movie called Funny Money in the mm -hmm. 80s or something, and so it pops up. And then the last one is? Oh, It's Just Us, and that one's not out yet. It's supposed to have an actual screening, like studio release, or I mean, mm -hmm. uh, what do you call it? A movie theater release, premiere? I guess? Yeah, yeah, a premiere, that's premiere? right. There you go. See, I'm still learning. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea what I'm doing. You, you know wildly more than me about this subject, <laughs> I, I guarantee it. Uh, well, again, thank you so much for, for coming, and Absolutely. we can talk about all kinds of things together forever. <laughs> so, thanks, guys.